So we're going to get started by introducing our first scientist for this evening, which is Chris Ploof. So welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And Chris is a paleo paleontological specialist uh, who's been at the museum for 17 years and 11 months, 18 years anniversary coming up very soon. And Chris, can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a paleo specialist? What do you do? Um, I think that title is more of an HR descript descriptor, um, but my job is managing the paleontology fossil prep lab as well as preparing fossils. So that includes um, you know, managing the volunteers and, and workers here at the museum. And can you just tell us very briefly what it is to prepare a fossil? Um, when we collect fossils in the field, uh, we bring them back in these packages called jackets. And so it's my job to unwrap this package, uh, stabilize the fossil, prepare the, the sediment, the matrix off of it, and then um, pass it on to curation where it is identified, cataloged, and then moves into our collection. Very cool. And one last question about that fossil prep. Where, where are you getting it from in the first place? Where, where are you adding fossils to our collection from? Many of our fossils come from San Diego County, mostly from the coast. Um, so everywhere from Chula Vista all the way up to Carlsbad and um, Oceanside. Very cool. So uh, to get to know each of our scientists a little bit better before we start asking them all our questions, we've asked them to prepare two truths and a lie. And we will have everyone listening in tonight vote. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll. Chris, what are your two truths and your lie? So, um, one time I set off the fire alarm while pre preparing the fossil. Um, I, in the past, have gotten three speeding tickets in uh, the museum vehicle. And um, as a fossil prep technique, I microwave fossils. All right, so I actually do not know the answer to this. Uh, go ahead and put in your books. Give just a few more seconds. Which of those was a lie? Two were truths, one was a lie. These results are gonna tell us a lot about what the people listening think about your, uh, <laughs> your work habits. And driving. <laughs> yep, you're driving, whether you're responsible. They have a lot of faith in you. 50% of people think that the lie is the three speeding tickets while driving museum vehicles. Are you ready to disappoint them, Chris? I am. <laughs> What's the, the lie? The lie is I've not set off the fire alarm. And why did you microwave fossils? Um, I wanted to dehydrate it quickly, and I wanted to see if microwaving would be a good technique or putting it in the oven. Um, it was, I was just being lazy, and I really wanted dry fossils because I was wet screaming. Did it work? I didn't. <laughs> Too bad. All right, well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we, I think, are going to have quite a few questions about fossils tonight, so looking forward to hearing more from you. We're going to go ahead and introduce our next scientist, Dr. Ashley Poust. Ash, will you join us, please? Hey, Ash. So yeah. another member of our paleo department. Ash is the Colclo, James R. Colclo Paleontology Postdoctoral Fellow. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means, Ash? Yeah, sure. And postdoctoral positions like this are generally just meant to be research positions and sort of a bridge between doing a PhD and joining a, a, a staff in a form, formal or, or full-time position. Um, and so I've gotten to work on some really cool research here based on all the fossils that Chris and other people have collected over the years. Great. And can you tell us a little bit about like, your specialties, any fossils uh, that you really know a lot about or any prehistoric animals you know a lot about? Sure. Um, so I, I have on, on here, my areas of interest are, you know, dinosaurs and, and marine mammals. And that is like a core of my focus in terms of the types of animals that I work on. But that's also been subverted somewhat um, uh, in the year or two since COVID because I wasn't necessarily able to work on all of the projects that we lined up uh, at the beginning of my tenure here. So 
I've actually been doing a lot of work on small cat-like carnivores, and maybe that's something that will come up again later, but we named a really cool little animal that's not a cat, um, but was saber-toothed and convergent with cats, which is what I'm holding in the picture here based on a lower jaw, um, Diego Aluris, which is a, a, a local fossil um, collected from one of the mitigation projects that um, I think was well before Chris's time, but but was similar to the things he was describing. Um, and yeah, so that, that's been kind of like a fun recent focus. Very cool. And I'm just going to head back to Chris for just one second here. Chris, can you tell us what mitigation means in this context? Um, monitoring and mitigation is basically we are um, fulfilling requirements, um, environmental requirements set forth by the state of California. Um, certain cities, jurisdictions will require that there be a paleontologist on a construction site while they're impacting sediments that are deemed to be sensitive. And so we will have our paleontological monitors out there looking for fossils while they're digging, impacting sediments, excavating, whatever they're doing, um, we're looking at the dirt. Great. So you bring them back from the construction sites and actually study them once they arrive. Sounds about right. All right. So Ash uh, also is a Star Trek fan. Thought it was important to note that because we've got another scientist coming up who's a Star Wars fan. So we are going to go ahead and give Ash's two truths and a lie. Uh, do you mind telling us what those are, Ash? Sure. Um, is, that, is the thing going to come up here? We get in the right order. Um, so I, even though I don't get to see them a lot, I have three horses back in Iowa. Um, one time I uh, was flying and was detained in an airport in Guatemala for bringing a seismometer on the airplane. And I got married and it was on This American Life on NPR. All right, give us your votes. Which of those is the lie? These are great, Ash. I really didn't know. Chris and I actually had a discussion this afternoon <laughs> about which it could possibly be. All right, we'll give a few more seconds here. Everyone believes you were detained in Guatemala, <laughs> just about. But we've got an even split between three horses back in Iowa and getting married on NPR. What is the, the lie? I don't own any horses. Uh, I do like horses, but I've never been in a position to, to have them. Um, the Guatemalan thing was actually, it was a little frightening. Everyone was very happy, but they were very militant about it. I was detained by armed guards. I think they thought I had, I don't know, illegal equipment or a bomb or something. You know, it's like a heavy metal seismometer. It's a heavy metal thing with gyroscopes in it. And uh, yeah, I don't know what the heck they thought. I declared it, but um, they figured it out eventually. My Spanish was not up to that task. And then um, the NPR thing was fun. A, fr a high school friend of mine, um, Lisa Arrett, was working as a volunteer at this um, retirement home for people with Alzheimer's. And they decided to stage a faux wedding as an engagement technique. All these people had these memories of their own weddings and of their children's weddings that they could access. Um, and so but uh, she, she asked me to participate. Um, Anyway, it was, it was a very fun experience and somehow um, Ira Glass caught wind of it and they recorded us. And so he makes fun of me on there and interviews her. It was nice. That is so cool. So cool. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and introduce our next speaker for this evening. We've got Frank Santana. Frank, will you please join us? Um, Frank is Star Wars. My, fan. my video is not starting for some reason. Huh. Let me see. I'm able to start video. There we go. Oh, great. Hello. Frank. Another bald guy. We need some diversity <laughs> up in here. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Um, Frank is the collections manager in herpetology. He's been at the NAP for three years. Frank, can you uh, quickly? explain what herpetology is? Yeah, herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. And then in my job, I do a lot of field work, conservation work, monitoring sensitive species, um, mostly with amphibians. Very cool. And what's going on in this picture that we have here? That is the first year that we uh, collected California red-legged frog eggs from Baja, California and then uh, transported them across the border into the United States. 
where we've reintroduced them three times now. So we've done this three years in a row. So it was a big day to collect the eggs and uh, drive them across the border. Yeah, that's huge. And they're doing well now, right? Yeah, they're doing good. Um, we've had successful metamorphosis and survival um, of those egg masses for three years in a row. We're actually going out um, to kind of plan sites where we're going to put audio recorders and try to see if we can hear male frogs calling this winter during the breeding season. So that'll be a big milestone if we get some um, breeding behavior. Very exciting. Very, very cool. Well, Frank, you also told us two truths and a lie. I'm going to launch the poll. These are abbreviated versions of your of your story. So uh, give us the whole things. All right. Okay. So mine are all uh, reptile or uh, they're all reptile based actually. So um, on a recent survey, we collected a two striped garter snake that smelt so foul and musked on me that I lost my appetite for the rest of the day. The first one. The second one is that we were in Baja, California doing some surveys for reptiles and caught a six foot long coach whip snake. Um, and I was terrified of it. I was scared to open the, the cage thinking it would bite me because they tend to be biters and then ended up just playing dead for 20 minutes. The third is that um, on a recent survey with uh, flat-tailed horn lizards, um, we were I was squirted um, with it uh, from blood, it squirted blood out of its eyes and it um, you know, really startled us and it did that as a defense mechanism. Those are all very upsetting. I'm hoping that you tell us it's three lies and no truths, but we'll see. Can you have a few more moments for voting? You have a perfectly even split at the moment. And have you always liked snakes and amphibians, Frank? Uh, yeah, my uncle used to take us camping and we would drive along the roads and for snakes out in Anza Borrego just to check them out to see um, what was out there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of what got me into it. Very cool. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And which one was the lie? The lie was the horn lizards. Uh, so the um, they don't actually, shoot blood out at people they do it with dogs because their defense mechanism is mostly with coyotes so if a coyote had a horn lizard in its mouth it would squirt out some blood so it would taste really bad and it would drop it and run away um, but with humans we don't tend to trigger that behavior i guess um, so if you're picking up a horn lizard it's there's no chance of it um, unless you have your pet dog by your side there's no chance of it shooting blood at you but they can do that they just don't oh do it to humans. Gosh. Have you seen it happen? I've never seen it. I've only seen pictures before. Sounds gnarly. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are going to invite our last speaker. We're getting that um, not bald guy diversity now. Welcome, Ari. Thanks so much for being here. And I Ari, can go shave my head really quick if you want. <laughs> Come right back. Yes. Uh, Ari is our research library director and curator, and um, they are actually fairly new to the museum. She's been here for about a year now. So Ari, can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a librarian at a natural history museum? What it means to be a librarian? I mean, it's funny that you kind of can't um, explain it in one sentence because I get asked so many random questions every day, which is what I love about my job. So like sometimes someone will ask me about Black Widows and somebody asked me like, what is the history of this lighthouse and how do you cite this paper? And like, it's interesting to me that I don't have to pick one focus that I can help everybody and learn at the same time that I'm helping them. Very, very cool. And I don't know that people necessarily realize that we have a library at the museum. Can you tell us a little bit about what is in that collection? Yes, I can. Um, we actually have 117,000 items in our library collection. Um, and it's actually comprised of seven mini collections. So we have books, journals, rare books, archives, art, maps and photographs. And I have to know how to properly preserve all of those items 
and then also make them available for people. I, I think of myself as an information facilitator, like trying to connect information and people and resources all together. Thanks, Ari. All right, so we've got two truths and a live from you as well. So I'm gonna pull those up. What are your three stories? Okay, uh, so my first is that I have a tattoo of a cherry blossom tree up my back. My second is that I went shark diving in Hawaii once. And the third is that I once fell down a waterfall in Puerto Rico. I have no idea. And Ari refused to tell me when I asked. Everyone thinks I'm very tattooed apparently, that's cool. <laughs> I just give off that vibe. You do? Yeah. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> All right, so we've got a pretty even split between the second two, shark diving and falling down a waterfall. Okay, um, the cherry blossom is the lie. Wow. I have a tattoo on my back, but it's something else entirely. Um, I lived on Hawaii for a couple of years, and I went shark diving in a cage out there. Um, and I guess I give off nervous laughter because they could hear me laughing from the boat. Um, and then I also, um, in Puerto Rico with a bunch of friends, we climbed up to the top of a waterfall and I was just traipsing along and I slipped on a wet rock and fell all the way down. And luckily there were guys just right at the bottom that caught me before I went down this huge ledge and bashed my head against the rocks. Oh my gosh, that is terrifying. Be careful of slippery rock. I blame moss, to be honest. Sure, sure. So um, I've got a couple questions for you all, uh, but we also already have a couple in the Q&A box. So let's start there and then we'll go back to uh, some others. So one, one of these I think was for Frank um, related to the story you were telling us about your photo. So someone wants to know a little more about why you were taking the eggs. Yeah, so California red-legged frogs just do occur all throughout Southern California. Um, they used to be widely distributed in this area, but because of habitat loss and invasive species, um, climate change, there are very few populations left in Southern California. And in San Diego and Riverside County, they, they've been completely extinct for about 30 years before we did that egg translocation. And the reason why we're taking them from Mexico, um, because there's some populations in, in LA, um, Santa Barbara, of red-legged frogs, but we did the genetics uh, analyses to understand what the population history looks like. So uh, we collected frog eggs from Mexico because those are their most uh, closely related relatives. Um, so we took the eggs from Mexico and then brought them back here. And we have them at two sites right now. And we're doing a lot of monitoring and hoping to get the populations um, to be self-sustaining so that we can have them breeding on their own um, and then start to spread those ones by moving their eggs within the United States. And, and, but they're also endangered in Mexico. So there's only um, 10 populations that we know of in Mexico. So we're still doing a lot of work. While we're taking some eggs, we're protecting the populations and enhancing the habitat in Mexico at the same time and collaborating with our Mexican colleagues. So it's a benefit to the frogs, both in Mexico and the United States. That is so great. That is one of the projects I think um, the staff as a whole is most excited about really getting to see the, the impact of your work, Frank. How cool. Um, we have a question that is for the paleontologists. What would the terrain of San Diego have looked like a million years ago? I guess I'll I, guess I, could, I could start with that and then Chris can jump in with some. Uh, additional observations if you want. Basically, that was sort of in the middle, the height of the ice age. So a million years ago is a really long time by our perspective, but not that long in terms of what we call deep time, the whole history of the earth, or even the, the shorter history of California. So it would have been about in the place that it is today. And overall, California would have borne a lot of similarities um, to what it looks like uh, in the present. Um, there would have been, you know, oak savanna and, and grassy areas, et cetera. But the, the big differences would have come in, I think, for a lot of the animal life and where the coastline would have been. So 
uh, during the ice ages, obviously a lot of the surface water on the earth is tied up in these big continental ice masses. Antarctica is a lot bigger and really all of um, the northern part of uh, the Arctic Circle, especially in Arctic Canada, um, was just covered in mile high glaciers as far south as like Chicago. So even though that feels really far away from San Diego, that actually lowered the level of the um, uh, of the coastline, the, the sea level worldwide by a significant amount, tens to hundreds of meters. So that means that in about a million years ago in places like England, there was no island. It was connected to the mainland. The Channel Islands off the coast of California were still separated by a mile or two of relatively deep water, but they would have been all one huge island rather than separated out as they are today. And there would have been a big plain of relatively, relatively flat, uh, grassy area off the coast of a lot of California um, that would have included some areas around San Diego. Um, there would have still been some deep water areas. If you look at like a bathymetric map like sailors and divers use, you can see that there are some pretty deep places off the coast of California too, including some places the navies like dump munitions and stuff. Um, those would have still been water, but uh, it would have extended out a lot further. So rather than the San Diego that looks the way it does today with a, a bay that comes in and an island, the island probably would have extended much further off and it would have been covered by really bizarre animals like giant mammoths and mastodons, um, horses, camels, all kinds of stuff that we don't think of today as being part of the North American or the San Diego landscape. I don't know, Chris, you've like dug up whales and stuff in downtown San Diego. So as those ice sheets came and went, I mean, the water would have been coming up and going back, right? I mean, I don't know if you have any other comments about that. You basically hit everything on the head. Um, my addition is, you know, the sea level fluctuations could have been up to 600 feet. And so downtown would have been underwater and it would have been terrestrial and moving back and forth throughout time. So, um, yeah, when you say a million years ago, I don't know if that's their interstitial or stitial, which means the hot or the cold period yeah. off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, it would look similar, but different as far as like faunal composition is concerned, yeah. Chris, um, speaking of faunal composition, Ash mentioned a couple of animals in there that you would have seen back at that time. Have you found any of those fossils recently? Have you found anything from about a million years ago, a camel or a whale? Um, oof. Uh, more in the hundreds of thousands of years, not into the million years. Um, we found a bison at the new Snapdragon Stadium where the old Qualcomm was that we're about to open that jacket and do fossil preparation on that. Um, we have retrieved um, what we thought was mammoth, but we might think is mastodon now, fossils from UC Irvine. They're creating a new medical center um, up yonder in Orange County, um, but we haven't, we don't have a relative date on that just yet. But it's Ice Age. Very cool. Great. So I'm gonna move now um, to a question that I have for you guys, and then we'll get back to this Q&A box in just a few minutes. So this one actually came in from um, our Instagram account from someone called Anaswar Anu. And this question is, what is the importance of biodiversity research? Basically, why should someone who isn't a scientist care about the discovery of a new species, about the preservation or conservation of biodiversity. And I'd love to hear a little from um, Frank about this, as well as the paleo team. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I can start. So in our collection in herpetology, we have reptiles and amphibians again, um, and we have 76,000 specimens preserved. And with each of those specimens, we have a history of where it was collected, when it was collected, um, all those details. And sometimes we have species that um, are called one thing, you know, if they were collected in the 1920s, they might've been called one species. And then today we have more modern techniques where you can look at DNA and we have a lot more um, technology to start to understand more about, is that really just one species or is it multiple species? So um, an example is the cryptic species. And we had a species of rattlesnake from Mexico that was recently described as a new species um, a few years ago. And that allows, you know, if we can say that's a new species, we have this specimen in our collection. We had scientists that came and looked at that specimen and determined, yes, it is a new species. Um, that allows us to understand more about like how we can conserve that population. So 
um, we've found out that the population is actually not that widely distributed. It's kind of found in a small little area within Mexico. So knowing that helps conservation groups uh, make sure they protect that habitat and keep that species from going extinct. Um, and the, if you have more complex components of the food web, you know, like you have a more um, stable intact ecosystem that keeps everything working well and that benefits people as well because um, you know, if snakes eat rodents and that keeps diseases from coming into us, like things like monkeypox, which is actually originated in rodents, um, that keeps a good balance for humans and animals. So. I think it's really important to encourage like studying ecosystems altogether um, because there are so many examples of people like introducing a fish to a pond without understanding the ecosystem and how it affects everything that's there. Um, but Frank, I really like this idea of like going back and like re-looking at science and history um, because I, I think it's important to show that like science isn't fixed. Like a lot of people think like, we know everything there is to know. And like, that's just not true. So especially when we have like kids come in for tours, I like to encourage like, there's so much we don't know, like go study that, please. Somebody needs to. I'd like to bring up, a, oh, hold on one sec. <laughs> what you do? No, my, it's like a, sorry about that. There's like a sensor and if I don't move from my desk for about 15 minutes, it like turns the lights on. Too sustainable. We're gonna have to get like dance performances every 15 minutes through the rest of this. But I just want to bring up an idea of, that makes paleontology a little bit relevant to these, these questions of biodiversity. Because it's of course like in the most basic framework, diversity, how many types of organisms you have around is deeply central to paleontology. That's one of our main pieces of information that we can get out of a fossil record. But how does that come back to this idea of conservation? And that one thing I'd like to bring up that I think touches a lot on, on all of our work here at the NAT is the idea of the changing baseline. And so that is the idea that human memory and human cultural memory is actually pretty short. And we think that the thing that we see in front of us is quote, normal. And so we can be in a, an empty house and say, well, that's the way that it is. And we forget that, you know, that house was full of joy and laughter, you know, whatever that weeks, only weeks ago. And so by that, I, what I'm referencing is that extinction is a thing that was, that's difficult to detect in the modern. We don't see extinction happen that often, even in these greatly increased current times uh, of, of extinctions that ha are happening on a literally, by some accounts, nearly daily basis. Um, but we can detect that in the fossil record by getting good measures of diversity. And so these, uh, the knowledge that we have of mass extinctions that we can use to compare to the current biodiversity crisis largely comes from those same measures of figuring out how many organisms are alive at a given time and how those come and go um, uh, as the years click on. Um, and so that's one thing I think about that's really important about museum collections is if we wanna know that those animals that were roaming around San Diego were here a million years ago, when did they leave? Should they be here now? Um, and even as recently as 50 or 100 years ago, where uh, were red-legged frogs? I mean, people aren't used to having them. And so you can just say, well, that's normal to not have them, right? Because um, only in the matter of a few decades, I think that memory fades. And so that's one of the reasons why having a museum collection in particular that uh, extends far back enough, either through the utility of the fossil record or through the age of the collections themselves is integral to our decision-making process. Great, thank you, Ash. That was a truly tragic metaphor with the house empty of laughter, but I think, I, I think that that's that. not yeah. too far off. I mean, that's pretty much happened on a lot of places on land and it could happen in the oceans within a couple generations if we're not, if we don't make decisions here, right? So. Absolutely. So Ari, we've got a question for you here in the Q&A box. And just as a reminder to everyone listening, you can put your questions in this Q&A box. You can also thumbs up other questions. If you uh, see one you like, you can comment on questions and please attach your names to questions so we can give you shout outs. So this one is from anonymous attendee. They wanna know how old is the NAT? Do you mind telling us a little bit about the history of the museum? Yes, so the museum is 148 years old. So we turned 150 in 2024. Um, and for archivists, that's a big deal. We don't get to shine a lot in archives. Um, so the museum actually started as a society in 1874. 
Um, so there were a few people who lived locally um, who got together and compared their like shell and insect and um, like botanical collections with each other. It was in the Victorian era when scientific literature was like the cool thing to do to like read the latest like scientific finding. Um, so they got together and started comparing their specimens and then also sharing their like scientific literature with each other. Um, and it started in what was a really small town. There were 3000 people in San Diego at the time. Um, and yet these people interested in science and natural history got together and started sharing. And they just met in each other's like houses. They had salons and they'd have like, you know, this person would talk and present about their findings and they moved to libraries and they went to the Hotel Cecil in downtown San Diego for a while, which is very different from the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles. Um, and they actually moved around the park for a while. So Balboa Park was built in 1916 for the Panama California Exposition when the pa Panama Canal opened because people could finally get to San Diego through the Panama Canal. You didn't have to take this long, arduous land journey. So we had the World's Fair here. Um, and we were in, I think, the Canadian building at the time. And then the building where we actually now stand, um, that burnt down. And they rebuilt in 1931, knowing it would be a natural history museum. Um, Ellen Browning Scripps donated a lot of money for us to build a fireproof building. So we built part of the building in 1931 and we finished it in the late 90s, I think. Um, so it's it's weird to think of our society is much older than our building, which is almost as old as our state is, um, which is a very long, complicated answer for 150 years. No, that's great. Thank you, Ari. You can tell the building was completed in the 90s because it has a very mall, mall vibe to the architecture. <laughs> Popular way to do things at that time. So we'll be doing all kinds of celebrations for our 150th, so definitely keep an eye on the website. Were you going to add something, Ari? Well, I was going to say, like, even the old part of the building was built in the 30s, so it was in Art Deco time but they referenced earlier eras. So you can see Art Deco and this like Spanish style also coming through at the same time. Totally. Yeah, it is an interesting, interesting building and place. Um, so we've got a bunch of great questions in here. Um, let's, let's do uh, another paleo question. This one's from Jody. And Jody is wondering whether we have any Pacific walrus fossils. So I don't want to keep stealing time from Chris. I think seeing some of the questions at his time will come though. So uh, I want to just say yes. And I'll also get up again because I have this right here. This might be relevant. Um, so there's sort of two ways to answer this question. Um, there are walruses throughout time. We're left with only one type of walrus today that primarily lives in the Arctic. And so we see walruses, we're used to seeing walruses on uh, occasionally on beaches, but mostly on ice flows sitting around and, you know, just lazily trying to sun themselves in the very, very cold north. But they actually used to extend since the Miocene, which is a time period more than 20 million years ago, in part, uh, you know, all around the world, down to Japan, down to, down to California. Um, and so there are walrus records everywhere and there are multiple types of walruses, but the big toothless tusky wal walruses that we have today really actually got to the like height of their evolution here in San Diego. And so this is a type of walrus um, that's uh, called Valenictus Chula Vistensis. So if those of you in the San Diego area, this was named after Chula Vista, which was where it was discovered. Um, and this is one of my favorite um, specimens in the museum. Like we have multiple individuals, males and females, older and younger individuals, they're gorgeous. Uh, and it tells us a lot about evolution because living walruses don't use their teeth very much for chewing. They actually suck the 
meaty bits out of clams and, and other shelled organisms for the most part. Um, but they still do maintain a couple little weak cheek teeth. Um, but Valinictus has totally lost its teeth other than its tusks. There's just nothing here at all, um, just bone. So it's in some ways a more, you could say, advanced animal along that trajectory. And yet it's the one that went extinct as climate shifted and who knows what else happened um, to the coast of California. Uh, whereas the living one still has those relic teeth. So it's a good reminder that evolution is like not in, it doesn't know where it's going. It's not in any particular direction. Um, we also do have a couple very rare instances of true today's walrus that are kind of made its way back down into parts of California and those sort of things are still under study. Great, thanks Ash. So that was one of um, your favorite specimens from the paleo collection. Um, I would love to learn a little more about Frank, Ari, and Chris's favorite specimens as well. And Frank actually sent me a couple photos because it's a lot harder to see something in a jar on Zoom. So let me see if I can pull these up so you can tell us a little about them, Frank. Can, All right. And I can is start by describing it. There it is. Cool. That is the um, cryptic rattlesnake that I actually described from Mexico. And the cool thing about it is that it's actually named after the Mayan god of the underworld. So Crotalus is the genus. The species is Miklan Tecutli. Um, so it's kind of a cool name, kind of describes um, the area from where it was found, named after the Mayan god for the underworld. Um, and you can see it's a very large snake. It's just really cool to see. And I love the idea that it was kind of like sitting on our shelves um, with all the other snakes, but because it's, it's the specimen used to describe and compare all other individuals from that species, which is called a holotype. So it's a special type of specimen that we have. So it's kept away under lock and key in our collection in a special area. Um, and it's just kind of cool to know that um, it's really uh, important specimen, unique and from Mexico. It's such a cool name too. Mm -hmm. Perfect for a uh, Halloween time. Yeah. And he sent me one more picture. Can you tell us a little about this one? Yeah, this one is a California red-legged frog, and I think it's uh, it's kind of what Ash was saying about how we have a record of where these frogs used to occur, and this frog really fits in with the importance of that. So this one was collected in 1928 by um, Lawrence Clobber, who was our first curator of herpetology here at the NAT, um, and he collected it from what's now the Anza Borrego State Park. So this frog, you know, amphibians require a lot of water, was found in the desert here in San Diego County. So it's kind of wild, right? If kind of like um, Ash's anal analogy of the house, right? If you think of the desert now in Anza Borrego, you, most people don't really think of big frogs in the desert. Um, so it's a really cool specimen because it shows how adaptable the species is. And it really gives me hope for conserving them in areas where um, climate change has affected the amount of water that they have. I mean, if they can survive in hot deserts where it gets, you know, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, even in the 20s, it was getting that hot um, in the 1920s. Um, it makes me hopeful about the future. And I think, you know, you know who knows, maybe if, if we do things right and we can prevent the climate crisis and climate catastrophe, maybe someday we'll be able to reintroduce these frogs back into the desert here in San Diego County. Wow. Thanks, Frank. It's a really nice, hopeful message. Um, Ari, you also sent over some photos of um, something from the library collection since you are zooming in from home today. Do you mind telling us a little about oh. About picking yeah. my favorite child out of all of my children? <laughs> yeah. um, I seem to have deleted that slide. Wow, I knew I was having trouble sharing it, but I didn't know I did all that. We'll come back to you in just a minute. Sorry, okay. Ari. Chris, did you have anything that you wanted to share? Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy the specimen. Um, and it is an ammonite that is Cretaceous in age. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit fragmentary, but um, the really cool thing about it is that minerals dissolved in water and had precipitated out. And if you can see, there's a hound's tooth calcite inside of this. I don't know if my screen is. Um, you know, able to, to demonstrate the intricacy of this 
crystal um, lattice in here, but it's super rad and um, it's one of my favorite specimens here in the lab. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. That is awesome. Thank you, Chris. All right, Ari. Take two? Take two. Okay. How does that look? Oh, there we go. Okay. This is one of my favorite books um, because I kind of just discovered it in the rare book room one day. Um, it's a book about the most important grasses of the field and forest. Um, it was hand colored in 1871 and given to President Ulysses S. Grant. Um, and you can see if you get really close to like these scrolls on the page that's um, presented to him, you can see that there's little pieces that are off. You can tell it's hand done. Um, so Ulysses S. Grant, his son moved to San Diego and built the U.S. Grant Hotel downtown. And his son was a malacologist and one of our first board members and early librarians. So he gave us this book from his grandfather. It's leather bound that has these metal clasps that hold it together. And then inside it has grass specimens pressed and preserved in there. Um, it's gorgeous, phenomenal, it's huge. It's a giant book. Um, and to me, it's just like a little bit the beauty of discovery of like, again, you can't judge a book by its cover. You never know what you're gonna find. Um, but then also to me, like so important to get this digitized so that people could see it. Who knew that this book existed? Um, how important is it? What we could find in the specimens? Um, if there are other copies out there, I think it's just gorgeous. That's great. Thank you, Ari. There are really, really cool books in that rare book room. And is it possible for members of the public to visit the library and see the materials? Um, am I allowed to talk about a member day that might be coming up possibly soon? Please. Okay. <laughs> yes, there's a, a member day coming up. I think that it's in October. October 13th. Yeah, where we're gonna be opening up some behind the scenes areas. Um, and so members are allowed to come into the back, uh, the stacks of the library. And then also um, we host a lot of visiting researchers. So people who are just interested in something, somebody wanted to make a list of all of the fishes in the Gulf of California. So they came to visit and look at all of our books. Um, so yeah, if people just reach out to the library um, or come on member night, then they can come see it. Great, thanks, sorry, and I'll try to pop a link for that into uh, the chat in just a moment. Uh, we've got a great question from Faith. This is for anyone who's got a good answer. What is the strangest item that a guest has tried to donate to your department's collection? I think with that laugh, Ari should go first. I have just heard stories. I don't want to claim any of the. Mine is usually just books that often have silverfish in them. Anyone else? We have people coming in bringing specimens, um, more asking for identification than for donation. Um, but it's always the um, proverbial Jesus in a burrito where they think it's a fossil and it's not really a fossil and they won't listen to me or my expertise about it and they still believe it's a fossil. So that's my favorite thing. It, it, maybe it's not the specimen itself, it's these people that come in with such drive and desire and this unrelentless willingness to not believe me. <laughs> Chris, to add on to that, I actually had a neighbor out here in University Heights near Baboa Park um, who said there was a construction project going on in an apartment and uh, claimed there was a dinosaur egg they found. And I was like, it, I, I emailed the curator of paleontology because I was like, just in case, I don't know, maybe it's some important thing, but I don't think anything real. It wasn't, I don't think there was dinosaur eggs in the neighborhood, but yeah. 
I've certainly been guilty of this. I've, I've probably shown Chris things before and said, is it a fossil? No. Well, there's no problem with checking. I mean, we do that all the time. I, I'll, right? I'll be on the field and I'll be like, is this a thing? Was that this? And sometimes you might be like, oh, it's a dinosaur egg, but it actually is a turtle egg and it's a real thing. So it's not that. It's the like, it's the like, he, someone brings in the thing and that's a dinosaur egg. And Chris is like, well, actually, we don't have rocks that are the right age. So this must be something else, maybe a beautiful concretion. And they're like, no, it's a dinosaur egg. And you're like, well, then why, why did you bring it in? Like, what do you want? <laughs> sure. But like Ash said, it is it is always useful to check. And um, I have to say our scientists are really great about uh, looking into these things. So we do have people bring by cool stuff all the time. And, and um, if they have the time, they're usually happy to take a look. I will say if you have like a, a rug made out of an animal skin, especially one that's not from San Diego or Baja, California, like please don't email me about that one. We don't, we don't need polar bear rugs or tiger rugs or anything like that. Gosh, well, people probably don't want them in their home. Guests Me probably have something there. to say when they walk in. Yeah, I don't rug. Know. It's worth a shot. <laughs> so here's another great question. This one's from anonymous attendee. Has anyone um, been in a situation where you have accidentally broken a fossil or torn a page of a book or, um, you know, uh, damaged an, a frog egg uh, by accident? And how have you kind of recovered from that? And, and what precautions do you take to try to really take the best care possible of the collections? I have a book conservator for that exact reason, not for any damage I've done, but her job is to repair old damaged books. So if a page happens to get torn, I could say, Melissa, please show me how to fix this. Um, and maybe she can teach all of you guys someday. Maybe we can have like a webinar or something. And Melissa will show us how to fix our damaged books. Chris, don't you repair fossils quite often? I mean, maybe. Um, so <laughs> yeah, repair and maintenance is um, very important. Not only are fossils broken in the field when they're collected, but even when things are sitting on our shelves um, over time, the second law of thermodynamics takes a hold of our fossils. Um, and so this disorder continues to increase in the universe. And um, yeah, we do the best we can with the methods that we, we have to preserve um, these fossils for future generations. Um, the, my intent is to you know, make sure that if I am fixing something that future paleontologists that are preparators are able to unfix what I fixed. So perhaps there's a better method then for, for them to, uh, to kind of cure that, that problem. And what do you do if say, for example, someone like put your fossils in the microwave? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> They're really hot when they come out, I'll tell you that. <laughs> They're hot. And they weren't dry. They were just hot and wet. So, um, so... I mean, the stuff in, in natural history museums is inherently often somewhat fragile, right? Like that's why it needs to sort of be in a museum situation. So damage just happens. Like I I think the key is don't act like it didn't happen. I, I tell mm -hmm. that to students and stuff who, who I who I send to go work in different museum collections, or whatever. Like, damage happens. If you break something, we'll train you how to hold it and use it and study it. But if you break something, the number one thing you have to do is tell the collection manager, and they will nine times out of ten, ninety nine times out of hundred, be like, okay, no problem. Like, great, we'll fix that. You know. Well, I've been in situations to... though where we find damage and we're like, somebody must have damaged, you know, and then it's a problem. I was going to ask or say, like, I tell people with books, like, really, you're just looking at decaying treats. And like, you think about organic chemistry, like it's just trying to decay at all times. So we're fighting bugs, we're fighting molds, we're fighting just natural decay. But like, is it easier with fossils and bones? No. I mean, I would say it's certainly less, I mean, for example, there's a reason why, why, we have a lot of fossil bone or tooth material and, and less like fossil books. You know, it's just, it's a very soft 
um, thing. Once, once something becomes fossilized, it's, it often has the original material, but it often has been replaced by heavier minerals like calcite or, or silicon. And so that often tends to mitigate somewhat against decay. Um, but, you know, I mean, but then you get this fragility issue. You know, you can drop a book from the, the top of a shelf and if it lands right, it's not gonna be harmed at all. Um, but there's no way that a fossil, a heavy fossil can land right if, you, if it's dropped. But then on the, other on the other hand, it's like fire is less of a risk, you know, water damage is less of a risk. So I, I think there's, there's pluses and minuses. In general, I would say that they can be tough, but some of them are tiny and, and incredibly brittle. And, you know, I don't know. Frank, does just everything ruin amphibians? <laughs> Nice thing about the amphibians and reptiles that we collect is the majority of them are uh, kept whole body and they're kept in fluid. Mm -hmm. So we um, inject them with uh, formalin, which is a type of formaldehyde, and it preserves the body. And then we put them in ethanol to keep it from breaking down. So the biggest risk for that is fire. So our collection is in the lowest, lowest, deepest, deepest bowels of the basement. So um, as you were talking about earlier, Ari, about the new wing of the museum, which was completed, I think, in 1999. And um, so that was built specifically to house our collection of reptiles and amphibians in the, that wet collection in the very, very deepest part. Um, so for that, the biggest risk, I think, is just um, letting the, uh, if the ethanol or alcohol that we stored in the fluid dries up, then the bodies will start to decay. So you really have to make sure that you constantly have this topped off um, fluid that they're sitting in so that they don't decay. Frank, do you have to do you have to make sure they don't get too much like UV exposure? Because don't they fade color wise and stuff naturally too? Yeah, that's another thing. So we keep them in the dark and try to keep the lights off when we're not down there. So the UV will cause them to fade. And the, the colors fade through the um, alcohol and the form, form formalin that we keep them in. Uh, but it's uh, it, it's not completely gone. And then the light will over time fade them even more. And that's important because people like to compare um, different uh, patterns of what, you know, males versus females and things like that. For a lot of species, they're sexually dimorphic, so the males might have a different color or brighter color than the females, um, or vice versa. So having that preserved is, uh, is a goal of ours, yeah. Great, and um, I just put a link into uh, the chat where Frank shows that collection and shows us uh, what happens when the fire suppression system goes awry. Uh, so definitely check that out. So we just have a couple minutes left. I'm gonna just shoot some quick questions at you. Um, Chris, largest and smallest fossil you've worked with? This one's from Patrick. Um, so one of the smallest fossils that I worked with, the fossil itself wasn't small, but the piece that I had to glue back onto it was small. It was the ear bone of this little um, oridont um, that had broken off. Um, and so that required a lot of dexterity. Um, again, it was under a microscope. You can't use too much glue. It has to be just right. Um, the largest fossil that I've worked on, um, we did not removal of six whales that were stacked on top of each other in Orange County. And so as far as an extraction is concerned, that's one of the largest um, salvages that I've worked on. Very cool. Um, Ari, this one's from social media. Do you have any examples of interesting evolutionary strategies among our native plants? Yes, I would look up the yucca and yucca moth. Um, I have gone into like deep dives with them. Um, they have this like really cool symbiotic relationship where the moths lay the eggs like within the flower ovule. They actually strip the pollen off of one flower, fertilize the other flower on purpose because their um, babies eat the seeds. So they're making sure that there's seeds and food for their babies when they hatch. It's a super cool process. Um, so yeah, look up yucca and yucca moth. Very cool, thank you. That one goes out to Evelyn Martinez on Instagram. And Frank, uh, let's see, what morphological advantages accrue from being a snake? So I think this person wants to know like, why snakes? <laughs> why do those? Yeah, things? I think, you know, if you think about in your spare time, if you're going out to a club and you like to do this, the worm or the snake on the floor, right? You put your hands in on your side, 
so you don't get trampled and things like that. So if you are a snake and you don't have any limbs, you can squeeze into small little areas without worrying about your hands getting stuck, essentially. Yeah. Very so it cool. opens up new niches. And what's interesting is that snakes actually evolved from lizards. So snakes are lizards that evolutionarily lost their limbs. So it's kind of cool. They didn't, snakes, lizards aren't snakes that grew limbs and went the other way around that they lost their limbs. It's, it's easier for organisms to lose. It takes a lot more time for them to regenerate, to develop new anatomy. So, um, yeah. Wow. Very cool. I didn't realize that. It's like whales. All right. So we just have about one more minute left. Oh, gosh, we still have so many good questions. Um, but this one actually comes from Ari herself. So uh, Ari asked, what is the cool thing you have learned or discovered or the coolest place your work has taken you? Can we do just a lightning round on that? Did I ask, was this Ash? This was, this was like you Ari no. <laughs> su suggesting this question, so you better have an answer. Well, I, <laughs> um, well, for my own question, we'll answer it. Um, as just like such an uber nerd, when I go on vacation, I visit museums and libraries. And so since working here, I've been able to talk my way into museum libraries. So I, I went to a really cool one in the Netherlands called the Rijksmuseum. I talked to my way into the Rijksmuseum library for a little bit. I'm gonna say the same thing. I just kind of use the, oh, I work at a museum. Let me look at your behind the scenes. And uh, I've been able to do, um, yeah, the, uh, uh, the museum in Pittsburgh, the Carnegie, which was fantastic. Uh, one thing I think that's been really cool has been, yeah, it was hard because of uh, COVID, but trying to do some field work in California and some out of the way places. And one thing that we've been doing with the museum is trying to investigate this, these ice age time periods like the 1 million years ago question. And so we went out to the Channel Islands actually and uh, worked with both um, landowners uh, for the state of California and with the National Park Service to look for cool fossils out there. And that was just a really wild place we stayed in like this 1800s french sheep sheep herd house that was like beautiful on the coast it's all abandoned and falling apart and um uh it was just incredible to see california sort of what it looked like as it's recovered now as being part of this park service um what it looked like probably before the western settlers would have come here and i've reached my time limit again you gotta do the worm demonstrate <laughs> frank's uh, morphological <laughs> advantages <laughs> Frank, do you have a final answer for this one? Um, yeah, I'd say like when I get to work down in Baja, California, there's a really cool field site for a project we're working on. Um, it's about like a six hour drive from San Diego um, and it's right on the coast. So we get to hear the ocean and at sunset, we usually see dolphins swimming in the water. So we're out there doing a general uh, reptile amphibian survey, but we get kind of the perks of working in these really cool, beautiful, pristine sites that are often, um, you know, important habitats for endangered threatened species. Wow, incredible. Well, we are out of time. We still have more good questions. Hopefully we'll be able to do this again sometime and we'll bring in scientists from some of our other departments as well. Thank you all so much for um, answering questions this evening. Thank you so much to everyone who participated, who sent in their questions either today in the Q&A box or via social media. Uh, please keep in touch. You can get on our mailing list on our website. We've got another Nat Talk coming up next month. It's live at the museum, um, all about the flora, Baja, California. Um, and it should be really excellent, very interesting talk. So hopefully we'll see you there. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Emma. Thank you.